2 Samuel chapter 9 tonight. I believe this chapter is one of the greatest pictures in the Old Testament of the grace of God in the New Testament. Probably not a greater chapter in all the Old Testament. More beautiful picture of God's sweet grace towards messed up sinners like you and I than what we found and find in 2 Samuel chapter 9 towards this man named Mephibosheth and David's grace towards him. There's only 13 verses in the chapter. Would it be all right if we just read the whole thing? This is just going to be our jumping off point tonight. There's something in here I want to highlight. And we'll use a lot of Bible to back up what we're going to preach tonight, but everywhere that we'll stop in the Scripture, I believe, will be a blessing to us and something we can take away from it. 2 Samuel 9, verse number 1, if you found your place with me, say amen. amen. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba, and when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son. Evidently Ziba thinks David wouldn't want anything to do with this guy or he would not have put this disclaimer in there. Almost the disclaimer letting David know, yeah, there's one guy, but you surely don't want nothing to do with this guy because he's messed up. I'm glad the king still wants something to do with messed up individuals, which is lame on his feet. The king said unto him, where is he? Ziba said unto the king, behold, he's in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, from Lodibar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. David said to Mephibosheth, uh, and David said to Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake. And I will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant? That thou shouldest look upon, I like what he says here, upon such a dead dog as I am. You realize this ain't my message tonight, but if you study your Bible, you find David encounters two men in his life that claim to be dogs. One is a fellow named Goliath who says, Am I a dog? When David comes out against him in 1 Samuel 17, but he gets death because he does not see himself as a dog. He said, Well, my dog, you sent this little dude out here? Not some dog you can run out, run away from. Just run away out in the field. He said, And then this fellow comes up and he says, Not am I a dog? He says, I am a dog. And he gets deliverance. Can I say it determines what you get from the king? in what attitude you come to the king. You come to the Lord tonight and say, hey, I'm not, as, I'm not that bad. I'm a pretty good person. Am I a dog? I'm not a sinner like that preacher said. You ain't getting nothing from God. But if you'll come to the Lord and say, I'm just as low down and rotten as the Bible said, and I'm just as bad as the preacher said I am, you probably get what Mephibosheth got. He said, what am I? I should look upon such a dead dog as I am. Verse 9, And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto, all thy master's, uh, unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him. Thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, <laughs> he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. If there was ever a man in the Bible that could testify 
to the prodigal son song they sung a minute ago saying he let me come back home it'd be this guy in the story you realize where he gets to come to this was his family's uh House. This way, it's the king's house where Saul and them used to live at. Mephibosheth don't know nothing about that, but that's where his family used to live. And now the king's going to graciously let this child of the rebellious family come home, and get back to where he ought to be at. This man named Mephibosheth, we find a lot of awesome stuff in this chapter that I just throw out on the way into the message. And what I want to highlight tonight, we find this is a fallen man. We know in chapter 4 uh, of Second Samuel, verse number 4, we find that when tidings came of Saul and Jonathan's death at the hand of the Philistines, that his nurse picked him up and began to run with him, and she dropped him. And the Bible said he fell. And when he fell, he became lame on both his feet. This fellow has a handy cap in his life and the reason he has it is because of the fall of someone else. Someone had dropped him and now he has become unable to get to where he needs to be at. He's not just fallen. We find in verse 5 the Bible said he's fetched. I like that word. Evidently writers of the Bible are southern people. Said they fetched him. I like that good southern word. This boy can't get Brother Foster to where the king is so the king sends the royal chariot down to where he is to come get him. I mean, I don't know how that looked, but I can kind of surmise how that must have looked. Here sits old uh, Mephibosheth down there in the land of no pasture in a little old one-room shanty shack down there. And about that time, there's a knock at the door, and uh, he says, who is it? And they said, it's the royal guard from the king's palace. He said, boy, it's curtains for me. It's all over with. He said, well, come on in. Not like I can stop you anyways. And they open the door, and he sees sitting out in the yard out in the street out there is the royal limit man with the gold hubcaps on and the white stallions and chargers pulling that thing and man what do y'all want? All we know is the king wants you. We to pick you up and bring you to the house and they fetched him to the palace this evening. When he gets to the palace we find this fallen fetched individual gets forgiven. And David said it's just all forgiven. It's all forgotten. We're, we're putting it all behind us like it never happened. Like, like, like Saul had never done anything wrong to me. You you can just come on in the house and be a part of the family. It is all forgiven. We'll never bring it up again. We'll never hold it against you again. It's totally forgiven. We find he don't just get forgiven and he gets fetched. We find this fallen fellow gets fed. In verse number 10 and verse number 13 said he eats at the king's table continually. I like the hound out of that. I like that so good tonight, Brother James, because when a lame man like this pulls up to the table, you you can't see his lame legs no more. When he sits at the table, you couldn't pick out the lame guy from the rest of them. When you get to the king's table, it's all level at the king's table. Everybody gets the same food. Everybody gets the same meat. Everybody, everybody's level at the king's table this evening. Thank God for that. And then we find he's also fathered. In verse number 11, it said he'll be like one of the king's sons. I'm going to treat you just like my boys. No no difference in you and my boys. I'm going to treat the lame kid just like the kid that can walk and he ain't got no defects. Everybody's going to be the same. You say, preacher, what you getting at? I hope you see what I'm getting at tonight. Yeah. Neighbor, this guy is us. Yeah. I just preached your life tonight. Yeah. I just preached you tonight. Yeah. You say, that ain't me. My name ain't Mephibosheth. I ain't from Lodi Bar. I walked in here. I can walk out. Yeah, but spiritually, you're in the same shape that this fella's in. Lame because of a fall. Dropped way back there in Adam. Messed up. Can't get to God. So God sent his son. Fetched us where we were. Picked us up. And by faith in his son, brought us back to the king's table. He's fed us real good. He's fathered us real good. And brother, we now enjoy the blessings of the family. All our sins have been forgotten. It's all under the blood and it's covered and it's past. And we are here tonight shouting and worshiping and enjoying the king's house because we were just like Mephibosheth tonight. This is what I wanted to get to and what I wanted to show you though. I want you to see why David has mercy and grace on this guy. You say, preacher, did David just get up one morning, preacher Foster, and one morning he got up and he said, you know what? I'm feeling benevolent today. 
I think I'd just like to help somebody. You know, I just, I just, I just, you know, I've seen some commercials on TV about little dogs being out in the weather and being chained up, not getting fed good. And I've seen some St. Jude's commercials on TV and, and some, you know, Shriners Hospital. And I just started feeling benevolent. So I thought, man, let me just find somebody. That, hey, my brother, how you doing? All the way from Brother Greg Phillips Church. Praise God. Amen. He up here with you? Oh, hey, amen. Good to see you, friend. I, I didn't see him over. I'm sorry. I, I'm bad about chasing squirrels. Y'all forgive me. Anyways, uh, and, and, and I hope I don't recognize none of the rest of you. This sermon will get real long tonight. It, it, anyway, it, I mean, what's the point of this? And he just decided one day, I just think I'd like to help somebody. It's more than that, brother. It's deeper than that. You say, what's the point of him wanting to help them? Well, we find it in verse 1 and in verse number 7. They say it twice, and I want you to see it tonight because this is the crux of the message. Verse number 1, David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness? And this is the only reason I'm going to show him kindness. This is the basis, this is the ground for our relationship. Outside of this, we have no relationship and we have no standing with David. What is going to be the basis for our friendship, our forgiveness, and our relationship for Mephibosheth with David? It's these three words for Jonathan's sake. Verse number 7, David said, verse 7, Fear not, for I'll surely show thee kindness. And here's why I'm going to show you the kindness of God. For Jonathan thy father's sake and it's because of Jonathan's sake I will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father and it's because of Jonathan's sake thou shalt eat bread at my table continually you get restoration you get forgiveness you get redemption you get to my table and all of that is simply for this one reason you can trace it to one person uh, for Phibosheth you can point to one guy in your life and say thank God for that guy because without that guy I'd still be down in Lodi Bar and it's one person Jonathan's sake David is not being good to Mephibosheth because of Mephibosheth. David don't know his name up to this point. David don't even know where he's living at, Brother Lancaster. Up to this point, he said, where is he? He ain't heard of him. He don't know where he's at. He said, but I'm going to show him kindness for one reason and one reason only, for Jonathan's sake. And can I say tonight, there is only one reason and one reason only why God is good to any sinners that are in this building tonight. And it ain't because of your life's name. And it ain't because you're an independent in the fundamental premillennial King James Bible even walk right, talk right, don't cuss, drink, chew nor run with them that do ha, Baptist tonight. It ain't because you live clean. It ain't because you're awesome. I tell you there's one reason why God ever looked your way and God ever gave you the time of day and God ever fetched you and God ever forgave you and God ever fathered you and God ever fed you and it's all because of Jesus' sake tonight. It's all because of Jesus. It's it's nothing to do with us, but it's all because of Jesus. I lay claim to nothing of God outside of Jesus. I lay claim to no righteousness outside of Jesus. I lay claim to nothing in heaven outside of Jesus. I lay claim to no blessings of God outside of Jesus. I lay claim to nothing God's got except through the median of the man Christ Jesus tonight. Now you may sit here and you may sit here and think I deserve something from God. And I'll tell you what you deserve from God. You deserve God to bind you hand and foot and kick your sorry soul off in a lake of fire for all eternity where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's what I justly deserve. But I ain't gonna get it. Brother Jordan, I ain't gonna get it. You say, why aren't you getting what you deserve? And why are you getting what you don't deserve? One reason. For Jesus' sake. You say, give me a Bible on that. There's too many to give you, but I'll just give you one. Ephesians 4.32. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Even as God, for Jonathan's sake, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. And so tonight, just for a few minutes, if there's, if there's a type that awesome in the Bible, and that's an awesome one, then there must be reasons. There must be, there must be something about the life of Jonathan we could look at and see more of Jesus in it. I, I hope you appreciate the Lord Jesus because this message is going to be all about him tonight. <laughs> it's just going to be all about him. If you don't like Jesus, you don't care much about what I'm preaching tonight. And so I want to preach on the subject for Jonathan's sake, but while we're preaching on this, I hope you look beyond Jonathan. 
I hope you look beyond the fallen son of the king that died and you see the son of God, the king of glory that died and was buried and rose again. We see for Jesus' sake tonight. What's so wonderful about Jonathan? I mean, David, the, 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 the head honcho, the king of all kings, said, I'm going to bless this guy just for his sake. What's so awesome about him? Can I show you some awesome things about Jonathan? And I want us to look past Jonathan. Would you please look through Jonathan with me tonight and see Jesus with me? And we say, number one, I want to show you Jonathan's conquering. Watch Jonathan's conquering with me. Go back to 1 Samuel. This is where we'll spend the greater portion of the message tonight in 1 Samuel. And look at chapter 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13. This is the first mention of Jonathan in your King James Bible tonight. And it's no coincidence what we find Jonathan doing the first time that he shows up in your Bible. 1 Samuel chapter number 13 and verse number 1. 1 Samuel chapter 13 verse 1. Saul reigned one year and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel whereof 2,000 were with Saul uh, in Michmash and in Mount Bethel and 1,000 were with, this is the first mention of our character tonight, were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. And the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. Now watch, second mention of Jonathan. Watch what Jonathan does. And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines. Talking about Jonathan's conquering. Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Gipa. And the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines. The first time we find Jonathan mentioned in our Bible, he's winning a fight. And he's not just winning a fight, he's winning a fight against insurmountable odds tonight. He, he is going to a place where he's outnumbered and he's outgunned, but he's going to win the fight. And at the end of the day, Brother Foster, when he wins the fight, this is something, you know who gets the credit? His father gets the credit. It's almost like he come to do the work of his daddy. <laughs> It's almost like it was the Father's work that he came to do in this chapter. And after he'd done the Father's work, they said, Man, ain't the Father really good? That sounds like somebody else I know. You know where he won this fight at? I love this. Don't miss this about his conquering. Watch where Jonathan wins this fight at, verse number 3. It said, Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines, verse 3, that was in Geba. You say, preacher, that don't mean nothing to me. What's that got to do with anything? Well, you know what the word Geba means? The word Geba means a hill. The king's son, the first time we find him in the Bible, walks to the top of a hill and wins a fight against insurmountable odds. First place in the scripture we find him. He goes to the top of a hill and he wins a fight to the glory of the Father. Can I say that's what my Savior did? What's so awesome about Jesus tonight? Well, the first time we find him show up, he comes to do the will of God and he walks to the top of dark Calvary and in six short hours he said it's finished and he whooped hell, death, hell and the grave in three short days and bought our redemption. What's wonderful about him? He conquers when he shows up. And let me say this. I got to hurry because I got a lot of things to say in this message. But let me say this too. We find if you want to conquer, if you want to be a conqueror in this day, you had to go to Jonathan to help him conquer. You can't win no fights outside of Jonathan in this day. Check it out. I ain't just preaching. I'm telling you the Bible. Watch what your Bible said, verse 19. Look at chapter 13, verse 19. Chapter 13, verse 19. Now there was no smith. This is blacksmithing, talking about building things. There was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man, his share and his culture and his axe and his mattock. Yet they had a file for the mattocks and for the cultures and for the forks and for the axes and to sharpen the goads. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people. Watch it that were with Saul and Jonathan, but with Saul and with Jonathan, his son was there found. In other words, in this day, if you wanted to win a fight, you better make sure Jonathan's on your side because he's one of the only ones with a sword. Ain't nobody got a weapon to be able to fight with if they don't go down there to Jonathan and get it. Jonathan better be on your side if you're going to win a fight. And can I say, child of God, you can't win a battle in your Christian life. You can't win for God 
God, walk for God, win for God without Jesus. That Bible said we are more than conquerors, not because we think happy thoughts, not because we think positive thoughts, not because we got a mindset of if I believe it, I can achieve it. I'll just be honest with you. Can I just pause right here and say we are living in a day where there is so much of this psychosomatic garbage that's being preached from pulpits, very little Bible. That's one reason I like you, preacher. He's a Bible preacher. I like Bible preaching. That's what we're called to preach. We're called to preach the Word. I am not called, Brother Christian, to be a pop psychologist with this generation. I am not called to tiptoe through the tulips and try and give people pop psychology and make them think I'm smart and twist words and use big words and take one little text and then run as far away from it as I can and try and mess with people's minds. I'm to give them the Word. Why? Because we're more than conquerors through Him, through Him, through Him that loved us. I can do all things through Christ, through Christ, through Christ, which strengtheneth me. You want to win a fight? You want to get glory of victory over temptation, over sin in your life? You better get Jesus on the scene because you ain't going to do it on the power of the flesh. It's going to take the conquering power of Jesus tonight. Jonathan's sake. Why does David love Jonathan? He loves him because he's a conqueror. He's a conqueror. We love Jesus so much for a preacher. He's a conqueror. He never met anything that he couldn't conquer. Nothing. He never met anything he couldn't conquer. Anything they ever put in front of him, he whooped it. He whooped temptation after 40 days fasting and praying in the desert against the devil. They put blind people in front of him. Blind eyes couldn't stop him. Deaf ears couldn't stop him. Demoniacs couldn't stop him. Death couldn't stop him. Lame legs couldn't stop him. They put him on a cross and thought they killed him. Locked him up in a tomb. But a tomb couldn't even stop him. Uh, and he got up and went back to heaven. Uh, and this world thinks they've stopped him again. But they ain't stopped him, brother. He's still coming. And he's going to come back conquering and to conquer and be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is a conqueror tonight. I see not only for Jonathan's sake we see his conquering but we also see Jonathan's courage man Jonathan's courageous I wish I had a lot of time to preach chapter 14 this is a whole message in and of itself but I ain't got time watch chapter number 14 if you will with me we find verse number 4 it said between the passages by which Jonathan sought to go over unto the Philistines garrison there was a sharp rock on the one side sharp rock on the other side Name of the one was Bozes. Name of the other, Cena. You know, I, I enjoy reading military history and such as that. I was reading some military history one time. This is a true story. In World War I, the English were fighting against the Turks, the Muslim Turks, over in this region of the world in Palestine. This is a true story. And they had given all their men little small King James Bibles to read. England did at that time. They had sins. They ain't got no sins no more. And there was a lieutenant or a colonel, I can't remember which, he was reading his Bible one day, and he was reading in this text. And he realized, we're in this same place in the world. And there was a force of the, of the Turks that they couldn't whip that was entrenched where the Philistines were entrenched. He took his King James Bible, and he walked to his superior, and he said, there's a passage between two rocks in this Bible that if we can find it, we can get up behind them and we can whoop them. And they sent scouts out and they found them two rocks and come up behind them just like the book said and they ended up whooping the Turks because they had a King James Bible. <laughs> Hallelujah, praise God. Anyways, that's free. That don't cost you nothing. That's just some little King Jamesology right there. Now watch what it said down here in verse number 11. Watch verse 11. Watch Jonathan's courage. It said, this is Jonathan and his armor bearer. Both of them discovered themselves under the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Behold, the Hebrews come forth out of the holes where they'd hid themselves. And the men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us. We'll show you a thing. Jonathan said unto his armor bearer, Come up after me. For the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. Jonathan climbed upon his hands and upon his feet and his armor bearer after him and they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer slew after him. You can read the rest. It's an awesome chapter in the word of God. But we find this. We find this. Jonathan's courage. Now y'all, I read a lot of military history and I'm just going to tell you this. This is the worst battle plan I've ever read in my life. <laughs> this is not the plan for winning a fight. Here's the plan. That armor bearer sitting there and Jonathan said, I got the plan. It's just you and me, buddy. We're going to go whoop them. All right, yeah. 
What's it going to be? We're going to paint our face up, come at them by night, sneak up, sneak around, slash your throats in the midnight hour. What we're going to do? We're going to make, you know, whistling noises and make them think we're coming from over there when we're coming from over What are we going to do? He said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to stand up. We're going to say, here we are. That's what they do. They said, we will discover ourselves to the Philistines, and if they say, stay where you're at, we're coming to you, then we ain't going to fight. But if they say, come up to us, we'll go fight. So the, the plan of action is this. Just step right out in the wide open and say, here I am. That's a terrible plan. But that's courage. Two against all them guys, and they ain't hiding. They ain't sleeking away. They just stand up and say, here we are. Can I tell you my Savior is the most courageous man that ever lived? I, I can't stand what they've done to Jesus by way of Hollywood and by way of paintings and pictures and all that, making Jesus look like some lily white, 90 pounds, soaking wet, homosexual hippie Jesus, like he's some sort of Woodstock free love Jesus that sat down and just, you know, just took a toke on a blunt with his disciples and all that. That ain't Jesus. My Bible said he's the man, Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ, he's a real man. Yeah, carpenter from Nazareth, brother. Yeah, he's a real man. Yeah, yeah. And when they come to get my Savior in the garden, here's the Lord's plan of action. Talk about courage. He knew what was coming. He knew they were going to torture him all night. Knew they were going to rip chunks of his beard out and buffet him in the face and spit on him and slap him and then whip his back and then nail him to a cross for six hours. He knew what was coming. And they walked up to him in dark Gethsemane and they said, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. And he steps up and says, here I am. He says, I am he. And the gospel of John said, when Jesus said, I am, said all of them went, Pff. I mean, he Benny hinned all of them. Do y'all realize that the only people in the Bible that fall on their backs in the presence of the Lord are the people that come to arrest Him and crucify Him? People that worship the Lord in Scripture fall this way. People that are the enemies of the Lord and have a different spirit fall this way. Just put that in the back of your pipe and smoke it next time you're watching all this charismatic garbage going on. Everybody's, oh, oh. Yeah, you know what spirit that is. It ain't the Holy Spirit. That's a spirit from another world, brother. When Jesus speaks to his people, they fall on their face. When he speaks to Judas's people, they fall out on their back. Now you do with that what you will. All I'm saying is he's a real man with some real courage and when they come to get him to torture him, he didn't run, he didn't hide, he stepped right up, fed his face like a flint to the cross and said, I am he. Here I am. Take me, boys. Do the best that you can. I love what your Bible said in Isaiah 50. We always read Isaiah 53 about that great prophecy of Jesus on the cross and it's a good one. But Isaiah 50 is just as good. Isaiah 50 says, the, it's another prophecy of the Lord and it says who is my enemy let him come near and contend with me in other words on the cross the Lord put the challenge out for the devil I mean the night he went to the garden and to Pilate's judgment hall he put the challenge out and said here I am come on do your best shot and the bulls of Bashan and the dogs compassed him about and gnashed on his soul with their teeth and the imps of hell brother there was more going on uh, uh, during the night of the passion uh, uh, than, than, than just a physical beating. Uh, there was a spiritual warfare going on. Uh, and brother, they thought, I'm going to knock him out this ring. Uh, We're going to knock him out. Ain't never been a man that stood up to this. Uh, but Jesus took the beating like a man, uh, walked to the top of dark Calvary, stretched his arms out, said, it is finished, and won the fight, neighbor. Everything you got's because of him. I wonder, do you know him this evening? You know my Jesus? We see his conquering. We see his courage. Can I also show you Jonathan's curse? Watch Jonathan's curse. Here after this fight, we find there's a big slaughter that happens. Look down at verse number 24. Watch Jonathan's curse. Verse 24. And the men of Israel were distressed that day, 
For Saul had adjured the people, saying, Cursed! The Father puts a curse on men, right here in the text. Cursed be the man that eateth any food until the evening. Sounds like the curse from Genesis 3. Cursed be the ground for your sake. Everything you touch, thorns and thistles, it'll bring forth because you put something in your mouth. The Father's putting a curse on what you put in your mouth. It's Genesis 3, y'all. Saul adjured the people saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until the evening, that I may be avenged on mine enemies. So in other words, the Father says, Until I get avenged on all my enemies, there's going to be a curse on the whole thing. That's going to be a long curse. So none of the people tasted any food. Watch it, verse 25. And all they of the land came to a wood. There was honey upon the ground. And when the people were coming to the wood, behold, the honey dropped. But no man put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. Can't nobody get to the honey. <laughs> but somebody can. <laughs> Watch verse 27. Y'all, I love to hound out this stuff. Verse 27. But Jonathan heard not when his father charged the people with the oath. Listen to me. Jonathan is clear from the curse. He wasn't there when the curse was given. The curse is on all these people that heard it. Jonathan weren't there. He's free from the curse of the law. Ain't no curse on him. <laughs> Hallelujah. Heard not when his father charged the people with the oath, wherefore he put the end of the rod that was in his hand and dipped it in the honeycomb and put his hand to his mouth and his eyes were enlightened. You can keep reading, there's more good stuff in there. But old Jonathan says, man, oh, taste and see, the Lord is good. Man, I've come so that everybody can get a little taste of some honey because you're all hungry and you're all fighting a fight that you can't win and you need something in your soul. But a curse has got to be lifted before I can fill you up with something that you need. So what's he going to do? What's he going to do? The curse isn't his. He shouldn't be held accountable for it. But he's going to take the Father's curse on himself and save all of his people. Check it out. It's in the text. Watch, watch all the way down to verse number 42. Verse 42, chapter 14. And Saul said, Cast lots between me and Jonathan, my son. And Jonathan was taken. Then Saul said to Jonathan, Tell me what thou hast done. And Jonathan told him and said, I did taste but a little honey with the end of the rod, and it was in mine hand. Watch it, watch it. And lo, I must die. And Saul answered, God, do so and more also, for thou shalt surely die, Jonathan. The father said, you going to bear the curse because you took this. It don't matter that you wasn't here to hear it. It don't matter that you're free from the curse. You're going to take it for everybody. Thank God Jonathan took You say, why does David love Jonathan so much? Stuff like that. David said, man, what a man of concrete. What a man of courage. What a man that would take the curse when he didn't have to on himself for everybody else. You say, why do you love Jesus so much. He's a man of concrete. He's a man of courage. But the Bible said he took my curse upon himself. Uh, uh, the Bible said in Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it's written, curse is everyone that hangs on a tree. Jesus Christ wasn't born with a curse. He had no sin nature in him. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I couldn't work my way to heaven. I couldn't earn my way to heaven. The curse of God was on my life. But thank God somebody took my curse on an old rugged cross, deposited it in hell, got up three days later and sits at the right hand of the Father so that I can be free this evening. It's all because of Jesus' sake. I think sometimes we as God's people almost forget it. Sometimes we almost start thinking, I deserve to be here. You know, I wonder how many times Mephibosheth would roll his wheelchair up to the table. Nice clean clothes, smells good with the king's fragrances on him. And he pulls up to the table and he sees that big mess of food sitting there. He didn't get that much food in a month down in Lodi Bar. And I wonder how many times he'd sit there and he'd just break out squalling. He just starts squalling. Maybe one of the king's sons would say, What you crying about? You just don't know where I was at. 
I don't deserve none of this. You just don't know how good this is. You don't know how cold them nights were down in Lodi Bar. You don't know how hungry it was down in Lodi Bar. You don't know how lonely it was down in Lodi Bar. It's sure I don't deserve none of it. It's all cause of Jonathan and y'all. Every once in a while I look around how good God's been to me. I get to come up here and preach to you people. Pastor that good church down there in North Carolina. Preach the word of God. Every once in a while it just hits me so big. My seeing all the blue of the glorious thought my sin not in part but the whole nailed to it I don't deserve any of it it's all for Jesus sake can I give you something else I'll, I'm, I'm just it's, it's, show you something else he's got say why come David loves him cause of Jonathan's covering there's all kind of different types here watch the covering look at chapter 18 David has just slain Goliath and watch chapter 18, verse 1. 1 Samuel 18, 1. Watch Jonathan's covering. And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him. You know one thing I like about this too? Jonathan loves David before David ever loved Jonathan. <laughs> we, we love him because... He first loved us. <laughs> Verse 2. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. Watch it. Watch the covering. Verse 4. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. Jonathan says, David, I love you so much that I'm going to take my robe and I'm going to put it on. Can I tell you all something about David at this point? David's just a little old lowly shepherd boy that don't even nobody know who he is at this point. He's a nobody. He's such a nobody that when he kills Goliath, Saul says, hey, whose son is the stripling? Whose boy is that? Don't nobody know who he is? And old Jonathan says, you're a nobody. But I'll tell you what, you can have my clothes. Not just my garment, you can have my girdle, you can have my sword, you can have my bow. Just put it all on you. And I got to think it to myself, Preacher Foster, I got to think it to myself. I wonder maybe, just maybe, David now's wearing Jonathan's clothes. Walk that way. And old Jonathan's walking through the camp one day, just keep walking that way. And all of a sudden, Saul sees him and says, jo Jonathan, Jonathan, oh, Oh, you ain't, you ain't Jonathan, I'm sorry. But you look just like him. You got his clothes on. I couldn't tell the difference between you and my son. You look like my son. Because you had his covering on. From a little ways off, I couldn't tell the two of you apart. Thank you, you can sit down. Can I tell y'all something tonight? <laughs> when God the Father looks my way, He does not see me anymore. He sees His only begotten Son. Why? Because Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He has robed me in the garments of salvation. I have His righteousness applied to my account. And when God sees me, He no longer sees sees the record of a lost sinner going to hell but he sees his only begotten son tonight covered it's all because of Jesus when God sees me now y'all know I know practically I know practically I'm a sinner and practically I sin but positionally See, this is where so many people, they get their Bible messed up. They don't understand the difference in the practicality and the positional, positional righteousness of Jesus. Practically, I'm to keep myself in the love of God. Positionally, I can't do anything to earn any more of it, and I can't do anything to lose none of it. Practically, I am to put on myself the breastplate of righteousness. Practically, I am to awake myself to righteousness and sin not. But positionally, I have the righteousness of God deposited in my account and I can't ever lose it. Practically, I am a sinner that fails every day. But positionally, when God looks at me, 
He sees his perfect son. That as far as God's concerned, ain't never seen a day in his life. Son. <laughs> I know, I know you've heard this before, but it bears telling again. They say over in Europe and places where they do a lot of shepherding and lambing and things like that, they said there are times in the year when those mothers will uh, give birth to baby lambs. And, and many times when those baby lambs are born, the babies will be stillborn. They'll die in the birthing process, leaving the mother with a dead baby lamb. And then there are times when the mother's giving birth that the birthing process is so, is so tough on them and lasts so long and nobody's there to help them that they'll give birth to the lamb and the lamb will be okay, but the mother will die in the birthing process, leaving the lamb orphaned with no mother. And so they, the, the, the shepherd said, well, this is what we'll do. We'll just take the orphan lambs that the mother died in the birthing process and we'll put the orphan lambs in the family of the mother that lost the lamb. You know, it just, it just, then the lamb doesn't die. It can get the milk it needs and be in the family and everything's good. But they noticed this is something curious about what would happen. When they would take those orphan lambs and put them in the family of the mother that had lost the lamb, she would lean down before she would allow it to get any milk and she would smell it. And it didn't have the smell of her child. It had the smell of a stranger. And she would violently run it out and shoo it away from her and not let it into the fold. So this is what they come up with. They would go take the dead lamb, the dead baby lamb that died in the birthing process, and they would skin the coat off the back of that lamb. And they would take that bloody, dripping with blood coat, and they would tie it onto the back of the little lamb that had survived and push it into the family. They said that little lamb walks into that family and now the mother leans down and smells and it's no longer the smell of the stranger. It is the smell of her only child. It's the smell of one of her own and she takes it in the family. Y'all, that's what happened to us tonight. That, on Calvary, God skinned his only lamb and now has applied his covering into our bank account this evening. <laughs> Looking down through the ages, God beheld the dying soul. Sin had brought separation, and nevermore could man behold. So there must come a lamb, one whose blood alone redeems, bringing gifts to the Father of souls made white and clean. So Jesus left his home in glory. He traveled on to the cross just to bridge the gulf to glory and to rescue all the lost. And by his blood he entered into the throne room of our God and on the mercy seat he placed it it was salvation for us all and when God sees me he sees the blood of the lamb God sees me as worthy but not as I am he views me in garments just as white as the snow for the Lamb of God he is worthy and he's washed me this I know what's so great about Jonathan his covering, his curse, his conquering, his courage look at his cost you know what it costs Jonathan to be good to David Listen to me, listen to me. You know what it cost Jonathan to be good to David? Everything. It cost him everything. Watch what it cost Jonathan. Look at chapter 20 and watch verse number... Chapter 20 and verse number 30. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. He takes the wrath of the Father for somebody else. Verse 31, Saul said, For as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established, nor thy kingdom. Wherefore now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. And Jonathan answered his father and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain? What hath he done? And Saul is going to kill Jonathan because of him. Saul cast a javelin at him to smite him. The father says, You know what it's going to cost you if you want to be good to that guy? You're going to have to give your kingdom up. 
and I'm going to kill you. <laughs> you know what it costs Jesus to be good to a bunch of old Gentile dogs like us? He stepped off his throne in his kingdom and the Father, it was pleased him to bruise him. So what did it cost Jesus Christ to be good to me? Everything. Everything. You know, there's one of the greatest verses in the Bible. So I believe it's in the book of Psalms. And it's the Father talking to the Son. It's a prophecy. And it says, Ask of me the heathen for thine inheritance. Do you know what you are tonight? I don't think you know what you are. You are what Jesus Christ asked the Father for. Jesus Christ did not ask the Father for a throne and a millennial kingdom. That's what the Father's going to give him because he's pleased with him. The Father's going to give him that 1,000 year reign and make him King of kings and Lord of lords for a 1,000 years just because he's pleased in him. I'll tell you what the Son asked for though. He said, I want the heathen. The Lord said, you want what? Yeah, I see how bad you're struggling with all them bunch of Jews down there and all them bunch of Jews hate you and back up on you. I'll tell you what I want. Just that it, I want the heathen. You know what the Lord Jesus' inheritance is? He gets us. Y'all, that blows my, I ain't nothing. But the Son of Glory said, Give me the heathen for my inheritance. You say, Why? Because throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity, every last one of us will be saying, Worthy is the Lamb to receive glory and honor and power, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation, and made us unto our God kings and priests, and will reign on the earth. We're going to give him glory forever. We're his inheritance. It's all for Jesus' sake. For Jonathan's sake, I, I, I'm, I'm closing. Look, look here, we're running to the close real fast. Look at chapter 23. Watch Jonathan's comfort. Why is he so great? Because he comforts people. Watch his comfort in chapter 23. Verse number 14. It said, David abode in the wilderness in strongholds and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him not into his hand. Verse 15, David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life. And David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. Watch who comes to him while he's in the woods. You ever been in a wilderness experience in your life? You ever been in the woods and you didn't know how he's going to get out? Man, every day you got up and it just got darker and darker and dimmer and dimmer. And you thought, man, you just, how am I going to get out of this? And all of a sudden somebody come got in it with you. Verse 16, and Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David into the wood and strengthened his hand in God. And he said unto him, watch what Jonathan tells him in the woods, fear not. Y'all, I've been a few wooded experiences in my life as a child of God, but in every single one of them, the Lord Jesus Christ would come by and through His Word or through preaching or through a song or through the Spirit bearing witness that I'm a child of God, and He said, Fear not. I'm with you. I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. I'm here and I'm on your side. Thank God for a Savior like that. Give you my last one and we're done. Go to 2 Samuel 21. 2 Samuel 21. We lastly see Jonathan's covenant. Why is he so great? Because of his covenant. In 2 Samuel 21, we find the Gibeonites come to David and they say, We want all the children of Saul put to death. It's judgment day. The children of the rebellious king is about to get it in the neck like they deserve. David's going to kill them all. They all fix and get hung by the neck. Watch verse number 6. Let seven men of his sons be delivered unto us, and we'll hang them up unto the Lord and give you of Saul, whom the Lord did choose. And the king said, I will give them. Verse 7. But the king spared Mephibosheth. Why? The son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because here's the only reason he gets out of the judgment. This is the only reason he doesn't get hung up by the neck. Because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. Y'all, one of these days, there's coming a judgment. 
and all the sons and daughters of the rebellious house of Adam will all stand at the judgment. You say, preacher, are you worried about that day? Absolutely not. Why? You think you're better than them people? Nope. Born of the same stuff they born of. Same dirt, same clay, same flesh. I'm probably a lot worse. I, I know I am. I'm a lot worse than a lot of the people that's going to wind up in my lake of fire. Yeah, you don't really think you're a lot better than a lot of the people that's going to hell, do you? Can I remind you tonight, good people don't go to heaven and bad people don't go to hell. You hear what I said to you? Good people don't go to heaven and bad people don't go to hell. Say, well, what in the world? Who, saved people go to heaven and lost people go to hell. Yeah. And I don't know how that's going to shake out, Brother Foster, but I know in Revelation chapter number 20, that great multitude stands up there suspended and weightless out in front of the God of this universe after heaven and earth passed away and them books get open. And that Bible said, I'm not going to be on that side of the judgment bar because I'm covered in His righteousness. I'm going to be on this side of the judgment bar and I'm going to help judge angels according to the Apostle Paul. And I don't know how that thing's going to work. But I know there's going to be people on that side that I know and people that you know. And I wonder, I don't know how this thing's going to work, Brother Foster. Maybe, well, maybe somebody out here is going to look up and look at you and say, Hey, Lord, how come they on that side and I'm on this side? We smoked dope together way back when. I watched them get just as lit as I was. I heard them cuss your name just like I did. They fornicated just like I did. Seen them do it way back when. How come they ain't going? And there's only one reason. And one reason only. Brother, they point the finger at me. They say, how come? I'm going to point the finger right back at him and say, because of him. It's all, no, no, it's all because of him. Brother, you say, I, 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 I know what I'm going to tell the Lord. I get to heaven one day. Why I should get there? I mean, I don't think it's the way it's going to go, but let's just perhaps say we get there and he says, why should I let you in to my heaven? Yeah. And y'all, if you start out like this, well, because I, you done got a big problem. It, it ain't a first person deal. It ain't because of I. You say, why are you going to heaven? It's because of He. It's because of He. It's all for Jesus' sake. It's all for Jesus' sake. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. That's the only reason I'm going tonight, y'all. And every good thing in our life is all for Jesus' sake. I wonder, has all that righteousness... Would, would y'all help me, Lancaster family? Would y'all come sing something? Come on up and play and sing something for us. I wonder if the righteousness of Jesus Christ has ever been applied to your account. And I wonder if you're a child of God, do you realize that this whole Christian life boils down to... When it boils down to it, it says it boils down to for Christ's sake. Your position blessings and your practical blessings, it is all for Christ's sake. God don't love one of us in here tonight because of us. He loves us because of Jesus. You say, oh, I'll tell you what. I'm elected. I'm one of the elect. Do you know how you got elected if you are elect? Can I give you a news update how this election stuff happens? It ain't no glorified any meeny miny mo catch a tiger by his toe and if he hollers let him go. My mama told me pick the very best one and you are not it. Okay, you're lost. Let me go after another one. No, 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 no. That ain't election. Here's election. God chose Jesus Christ. That's the elect of God. You say, well, I'd like to be elected. I'll tell you how to get elected. Get in Him. And if you in Him, you want the elect. And if you're not in Him, you ain't one of the elect. Say, so how do I get in Him? You come to Him by faith and trust in what He did for you and not what you can do for Him. God will put you in tonight. It's all, I mean, a bunch of Mephibosheths sitting here tonight and we pulled up to the table. And I wonder if your mind, you could just sit here for a minute and just realize, this is all for Jesus' sake. If I got what I deserved, I wouldn't be sitting here. 
It's all for Jesus' sake. Let's all stand tonight. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Father, I pray you'd bless this simple little message from the Word of God. I pray you'd use it to be a blessing in somebody's life. Help us never to forget and always to remember that every good and every perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights, whom there's no shadow of every but of us and every good thing in our lives because of Jesus. He is the mediator between God and man. And all the good things come through Him. Help us never to forget it. Help us to always thank you for it. And if there be one in here that doesn't know Jesus tonight, I pray they'd come trust you as Savior. I could never have preached a message tonight like this about anyone else. You can't preach a message like this, Lord, about Muhammad or Buddha or Allah, Joseph Smith or a president or a pope or a king. There's only one person that I ever know of you could preach a message like this tonight and it'd all be true, and it's Jesus Christ. And I'm sure glad I know you. Father, I pray that you'd help us in Jesus' name. Amen, y'all. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.